Okay, so kinetics and equilibria. So kinetics and equilibria is module two under unit one. So module one is fundamentals in chemistry. And then module two is kinetics and equilibria. And then I think unit three is chemistry and the environment. Um, but I think a lot of people say that they get tripped up in module two. And I think that's because there's just, there's so many little topics and little things to get in this section on kinetics and equilibria that I think that, um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of room there where you can get lost. And so the module two starts with the rates, rates of reactions. So yeah, the rates of reactions, that's the first one. And there are a bunch of different, um, I guess like fundamental principles to understand with as far as the rates of reactions concern, what governs it, how you can actually speed it up. And just the things that you have to take, take into account when you're measuring rates and so on. And then you have chemical equilibrium, you have acid-base equilibria, buffers and pH, solubility product, redox equilibria. There is a whole bunch of topics that are falling under module two. But I think that there are some commonalities in terms of like understanding just how equilibria works in general and how it's shift, what you can do to shift the equilibria one way or another to make the reaction more favorable so you can get the products that you desire and so on and so forth. So there's some general, um, things that hold through that 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 hold true as you go through all these different topics. Um, but our starting point today will be rates of reaction, and so I know that we for unit one, unit one is from four thirty to to five thirty. So we literally only have half an hour left in this slot. So we'll see just how far we can get. So what are your thoughts on that? What do you think about that, that approach? How is this topic for you? Miss, um, I think we just started. Like I think from February the 16th. So I'm fairly new. We are at, I think, somewhere between chemical and acid-based behavior. So I think this class could really help me with this one today. Okay. Okay, okay, good. Very good then. All right. So I'll just kind of jump into it. And then maybe given the fact that you've already covered this first bullet, maybe you'll be maybe you will be able to like answer me and have a nice back and forth with me on the, the, the content of what I'm presenting to you today. Okay. So as I said, we're going to start with rates of reaction. Um, and so really, under rates of reaction, there are these, maybe we can very broadly like divide it into these sub subheadings, right? So you have reaction rates. So just like the concepts are on a reaction rate, what, is our, what do we really mean when we say a reaction rate, right? Then you have rate equations that you can write. You can write that from data that you obtain, right? And then there are orders of reaction. So we typically say a reaction is first order with respect to so and so forth. It's zero order, it's a second order, all these different kinds of orderings. And that just kind of really um, tells us what, what substrate or what reactant kind of dominates that, that reaction. Uh, we have plots that we can use to kind of further um, demonstrate this point or, or plots that we can use to deduce um, certain things about our reaction rates or reaction. So we have concentration versus time plots. We have concentration versus rate plots. And then finally, if you're given rate data, you're supposed to be able to do some calculations from that um, and be able to deduce things about a reaction from that rate data. Right, so we can divide the rates of reaction bit into these broad areas or subheadings. So when we talk about reaction rates, we often speak about the rate of a reaction. Right? That's, the, that's the basic, that's the fundamental thing. So when we say the rate of a reaction, we're typically talking about how 
you know, how the concentration of our reactants or our products change. Um, how, what, what's that change in concentration like? And what was that time that it took for you to have that change, right? So if I'm starting from say, um, let's see here, say I have, I have reactant A and I have reactant B and that goes to C. Well, if, I, if I'm paying attention to say just this reactant, I know what the concentration of that reactant is at a point in time. So maybe at T equal one, and I know what that concentration is at a second point in time, T is equal to two. So then I could say, well, what is the change that occur, right? So maybe I wrote this, let me, let me change the way I'm writing it here so you can see it more clearly. Ooh, I sure didn't want to do it, let me undo that. Um, what I want to do is take this off and say, we're looking at B, we're looking at how the concentration of B changes in a specified amount of time. So that change has to be within the same time window that I'm looking at. So I know my final concentration at T is equal to two, and I know what concentration I started with of B at T is equal to one. And so that change would be um, how long it took for that change to happen. So my, the length of time, the final time, uh, minus when I, at the time at which I started it, right? Very often your T1 can be zero. So say your final time is 15 at 15 seconds. And just say for argument's sake, six or concentration. What's the unit of concentration? Like what unit are, should we have, or would we have up top? What's the, what's the unit of, what's the rate? Yeah, what, what unit would the rate have? At a very general level, right? At a very general level, you know, depending on the order of the reaction, you'll have different um, units. But as a, at a very general level, what would be the, what's the unit of um, rate of a reaction? Yes, you're talking about like, like the more of them Exactly, yeah. So it would be, because we're saying it's, we're very, very, at a high level, it's a change in the concentration um, and the amount of time that it takes for that. So it would be mole per dm cube and how that changes the time, so per, per unit of time, right? So it would be mole per mole dm cube per second. So depending on what my concentration of, of, of B was at T is equal to two, let's say it was 50, then I would have 50 minus my initial concentration. Let's just say that was for 25 for argument six and say my T2 was say 15 seconds and my T1 was zero seconds. Then we're trying to see how much the concentration changed um, and how long it divided by how long it took for the change to occur. And then that would be my rate, right? At a very high level. This is kind of how we think about the rate of a reaction. It's the, it's the change in concentration of your reactant or your product and the amount of time divided by the amount of time that it took for that change. So it's just a rate. How fast is something changing, right? So that's typically what we mean by rates. And then let me clear this real quick. So then there we have this, 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 this conceptual understanding of what a rate is and what we're looking for, right? So right away we know that we want to be able to measure a change in concentration of that reactance of product, of the reactance of our product. So we want to measure change. And there are several ways of measuring that change, right? So for, for, C, for KP, you have to be able to, to, I guess, think of experiments that you could do to measure these changes or the change in concentration and so on. And so we can divide them into two methods. We have a continuous method and then there's a sampling method, right? So for the continuous method, um, really and truly the methods that you're using to measure the change in concentration of the reactants or products is largely dependent on the physical state 
of those products are reacting. So then there are different ways that you can you can measure this. So if you have a solid versus a liquid versus a gas, like what is the state of your reactants or products? And then you can tailor experiments to, to be able to actively or, or accurately measure what transition is going on in, in that system over time, right? So you have two methods, you have your continuous method, and you have a sampling method, right? So for the continuous method, for example, you might want to look at the volume of gas evolved over time. So if you have a gas phase reaction, maybe you want to see how much gas evolves over a specific over a specified amount of time, right? So you start your reaction, you start your clock, and immediately you start measuring volume, the volume of a gas, right? And you can use a syringe, typically you use syringes to measure that, gas syringe to measure um, that change in volume or the evolution of volume of that gas over time. Um, so that's one way of measuring rate. So you see how that changes, how that volume changes over time. Um, and then you can also use colorimetry. And do you know what colorimetry means? As the name, the name kind of hints at what exactly it means. So when we talk about colorimetric methods, what, what are we measuring? What are we using as um, markers, right, for change? Like, what are we using to, to say definitively that something happened? It's the color change. Exactly. So you're using a color change. And do you, do you have any examples that come to mind, like color changes that you're using to, to determine endpoints or whether there are any changes over time. Like, do you remember the example that you did in class for this? Did you do an example for colorimetry? I don't think we did an example for this, but um, Mr. Like when you're doing titration, you can see like the purple going back to clear to indicate mm -hmm. the, it's like to, to, to see when it's completely neutralized, right? Like when you're doing neutralization reactions, you can use that to determine whether or not it's 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 neutralized, right? So how long, yeah, how long it took for that? Well, I guess in that particular case is that your reactants would change the product. So there would be a change in concentration that you can measure there as well. So that, that's one way and that's using, um, that's um, acid-based indicators or indicators. Um, and then another example is like iodine, like you have reactions in which you have iodine at the beginning of the reaction, iodine has a deep brown color. And so over time you measure the disappearance of that brown color. And as you get to the end point, that color um, fades away. And so then you would know um, that that based on the intensity, what what's happening in that reaction, and then you can use what they call a colorimeter, right? Which is which is a which is a very specific kind of device now or, or or equipment that you're using to to look at to look at intensity or the amount of light absorbed or transmitted um, through the reaction mixture. And that will indicate to you just how much reaction has taken place and how much a concentration or, or whatever your variable that you're measuring in to how, how, much, how, how much change took place over a specified amount of time, right? So in, this, in these kind of measurements, you're, you are paying attention to the time is a time bound kind of thing, right? Because it's a rate. So you're looking at the change, but you're also looking at the time that it took for it to get to that state from where it started. And then finally, um, well, not finally, but like the, I guess one of the other main um, examples that they want you to cover for CAPE is this, um, the changes in electrical conductivity that can take place in a system. And then what do we mean by electrical conductivity? Do you remember what that, what that relates to? Electrical conductivity, what does that relate to? Miss Amit um, has something to do with like electrolysis, like um, miss how much of the substance was developed like in its modern state. Yes. Yeah, so that's 
that's it's it's nice that you brought up electrolysis because it's like it's kind of it's directly related to that um how you know is they're like ions that evolve over time in say how would i say there, there are specific classes, right, of reaction, reactions in which there are like changes in the amount of the, the, the ions that are present in the solution. So you have certain um, reactions that maybe like even like with oxidation or reduction kind of thing where you're producing ions from atoms, right? So you can directly measure a change in the concentration or, or a change in the conductivity of that solution because the remember that ions and electrons are conductive species. They they are when they're in their mobile state, they can carry electricity, right? So we can measure our conductivity. And if we have ions that are liberated as a result of um, a reaction that takes place, you can measure that using a conductivity meter. And the unit of conductivity is in Siemens or in S. And it's really generally like a probe. So like a thing like this. It has like a probe down here and you would like dip it in your solution and measure and get that reading. So if you have a, say you have H plus ions that come out in that solution. Uh, Mm. Yeah, you have H plus ions or you have Br minus ions, any kind of any ions, anything that's measurable, anything that can conduct current, right? You put this probe in it, they call it a conductivity meter. Conductivity meter. And then you put it in that solution so that your reaction, your reaction mixture really measure that. You get your what they call a conductivity and the unit is S or they call it Siemens, right? And you can keep track of that conductivity over time and how that changes. And that can be an, an indicator or way of, of tracking the rate of that, rea that particular reaction, right? So really and truly these methods that you're choosing kind of fall um, on you as a researcher or the scientist or the chemist and you have to know what kinds of things change in the reaction that you're doing and so figure out what best way you can measure that so you you choose the things that are measurable and easier easiest for you to measure so that you can track how whatever that thing is that you've chosen to track changes over time right that they are like accurate tried and true methods for you to do that kind of a um, measurement because there there are methods that you could select that wouldn't necessarily be as accurate as you would like to determine the rate of that reaction. So just keep those things in mind. But for the main ones, for continuous methods, mean that we're continually, we're measuring it over time, over time, over time. You have your volume of gas evolved, your colorimetry me measurements, and you have changes in electri electrical conductivity. Then now you have a method that's known as sampling, sampling methods which I was never really a big fan of because I feel like there's like a lot of room for error with sampling methods. You have to like be very like meticulous as you're doing these sampling methods. But when you do a sampling method, so let me see. When you do a sampling method, you're really um, taking, taking um, your reaction product mixture, right? A snapshot in time and you're taking that solution so, so you have it in the initial state, you allow the reaction to proceed, and then at a, at a snapshot in time, at a particular time, you pull out a sample from that, and then you kind of, you can use methods that they call quenching methods to stop that reaction, right? And then now you can measure what changes occurred based on what you measure at that snapshot in time, versus when you started out, right? And so these sampling methods are typically chosen because of, of the specific reaction that you have going on. Maybe it is that you can't, it's not something that you can measure continuously, right? It's something that you have to take samples to measure. And so that's when you use a sampling method. And so one example might be, um, 
you have so an example would be like the ketone you're in unit one so maybe you're not too versed on what a ketone is but propanone is a ketone that you that often they react with iodine um in an acidic solution and that's an example of a uh, and a reaction in which they do, they use continuous, sam they use a sampling method. So what they will do is they take the sample at a particular time, they add sodium carbonate to it and the sodium carbonate reacts with the acidic portion that's in that. So like there's like um, H plus ions that the sodium carbonate reacts with and kind of stops that reaction from proceeding further. Because I mentioned earlier, you have to do what they call quenching. So you quench that reaction, you stop it. And then now, you can um, you do a titration and you can determine the concentration of iodine that remains in that um, reaction mixture. So in my mind, my personal preference, I think that um, sampling methods are trickier because of the fact that you have to quench those reactions and stop them and determine, you know, like okay, this is this is this is the endpoint here and then let me just measure what's going on at this snapshot in time rather than a more continuous method where i feel like there's less human interference with what the reaction is actually doing and so i think you get a more accurate representation but that's just my two cents um so you have two methods continuous and sampling methods and so you should just be able to know within yourself um what each method if somebody gives you a method what you have to know what what it's capitalizing on to be able to do that measurement okay yes please. okay so then now um at really the core the crux of this whole um reaction rates thing is this idea of a collision theory that really underpins a lot of these concepts right even going forward and building forward when we think about um equilibrium constants for along the line and, and stuff like that it has a lot to do with collision theory right do you remember do you know what the collision theory is and how that kind of factors into um rate the rates of a reaction yes um I think my teacher was saying one time that if the collision theory, the reaction happens when the particles collide together. Mm -hmm. So like they measure how we go say how fast or so they collide together. Mm -hmm. So you need you need them to collide. So the collision theory within the collision theory is if you think about, um, if you go back to, I guess, CXC, right, fourth form, when you're thinking of the particular theory of matter and how you have these particles and when they're in different states, right, so you have a solid versus a liquid versus a gas, the, the range of mobility and how mobile things are, how much they can move and collide with each other, that very depended on, depend on the state that you were in, right? So, but so the ability for them to collide particles, the particles, I'm just speaking more broadly now, for particles to collide depends on a variety of factors, right? So like the amount of energy that they have, are they mobile and all these different things. So when we speak about our rate of reaction, we have to first make sure that the things that we have or particles can even move, can actually even move to begin with and collide with other um, the other um, reactants that we have to then form a product eventually, right? So in the collision theory, it says that the reactant, well, really and truly, the reactant particles, they have to collide with enough energy to break the bonds that are within, that are in them, right? So because remember that when you're forming a product, it's largely what's happening is you're breaking old bonds to form new bonds, right? So when, it, when the collision, when they meet, when the reactant particles meet, they have to meet with enough energy that they can break the bonds that, that previously held them together. And then later on, no, they can, um, those bonds can then be rearranged or reformed to make new bonds. And that's how you get your product. So they have to collide with enough energy for that breaking of bonded, bonds to occur. Um, so they have to break the specific bonds that are in their molecules, right? And then the reactant particles also have to collide with the right orientation um, 
um, for the parts that need to come together, come in contact with one another. I don't know why that did that. But yeah, so you have two reactants. So say you have A and B, right? So A and B, they have to come together within the correct orientation that they need to, because they have like what they would call like reaction sites, right? That that's where the reaction takes place. And so if they don't react, if they hit, they, they can collide, right? They have enough energy to break the bonds in their molecules. They collide with each other, but they don't collide in the correct orientation. If they don't collide in the correct orientation, it's not going to bring forth the product, the fruit that you want, right? And so not only is the energy have to be enough to break the old bonds that were in it, but in order to form these new bonds and create these new molecules, the orientation in which the reactants hit each other, it has to be right, right? So those things, those factors all have to be in place for you to have your product. So sometimes you'll have a reaction that doesn't really proceed because the orientation isn't correct or there isn't enough energy in the system to overcome the, the old bonds to make new bonds. So the collision theory is really just laying down the framework and letting you know that, you know, you actually need these things to happen before um, the reaction can take place. So yes, Anisha, that's, typical, that, that's along the same lines as well, right? So Anisha's asking about um, enzymes in particular and how they have active sites and it, it's like a lock and key kind of fit, right? And unless you have that fit, it's not, it doesn't really work as it should, right? So it's a similar approach where you have to have the correct orientation um, for the reaction to proceed because you need you need point A to come in contact with point B. So there are lots of things that have, there are lots of moving parts, there are lots of things that need to happen for a reaction to proceed. And so the collision theory really lays this down for us so that we know that, you know, that that's, that's how, um, this 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 works that's how this has to go right um so then we have this idea of an activation energy does anybody remember what an act what an activation energy is like what what does the name suggest we need activation energy also written as ea what is activation energy Anybody? I hear some rumbling, like somebody saying something. So the activation energy is just the minimum. It's a minimum amount of energy that the particles need in order to um, overcome that, to react, right? They have to have that minimum amount of energy to react. And then once you overcome the activation energy, then the reaction can proceed, right? So you, you need that, it's, as it says, activation, like it's needed to activate the reaction, so to speak, right? So Anisha's saying it's energy required for the reaction to start. That's exactly right. If you never attain the activation energy, it's not, the reaction is not gonna work. It's not gonna proceed, right? Um, so what, what happens is, um, at that, once you attain that minimum energy, you want to attain that minimum energy. And so we're going back to the collision theory. Once you attain that minimum energy, then the, at that energy, the particles have to be in the correct orientation at which they will then collide. And at that point, what's formed is known as that minimum energy, what's formed is known as a transition state, right? And the transition state is at that in-between phase between where you started from to know an in-between state to where you eventually want to be, right? So a transition state is formed at that point at which it has the minimum amount of energy and they're in the correct orientation, right? The, the reactants are then in the correct orientation, particular orientation, particular configuration is what they'll have at that point or orientation or there, there are numerous ways of saying that. So then now, all right, so we spoke about an activation energy, and I could just sketch for you real quick um, the general plots that you would see when we talk about activation energy. So let me just sketch that real quick before moving forward. So we have our plots here, and we have our energy, just the energy more broadly on the y-axis, 
and we have the reaction pathway down here, which is the path or, or how the reaction actually proceeds. So you have your reaction pathway. I'm just gonna write reaction path. Um, so you have your reactants up here, right? And you have your, yeah, this is a hump that comes down to your product. Products. And you have your reactants here. And then this, this is the barrier guys that we say you have to overcome before the reaction can even start and proceed. And this is what we call this arrow, this portion is the activation energy. It's a barrier really that you have to overcome before the reaction can start. And so up here now, once it has overcome that barrier, you're at this in-between state now. So at this tip here, is where you would have your transition state. Transition state. And then your products finally down here, right? Assuming that everything goes according to plan, they're colliding with enough energy, they're colliding in the correct orientation, then you eventually get your products. So that's one pathway. And so this is for what what's known as a does anybody know what kind of reaction it is? You have endothermic, exothermic. Which pathway did I just draw? Endothermic or exothermic reaction? I'm going to draw the other one so you can see them side by side. Um, there's this. Reaction pathway. And then the, for this one, you have your reactants being at a lower energy. You have your activation energy coming up and your products are high at a higher energy. So products are here, products, and then your reactants are here. And then, of course, that activation energy, you can kind of see that it's a, it's a little bit higher, larger, right, for this one. So from, the, from where the reactants are to the tip up, up here to where our transition state is. So the transition state is here. So... Does anybody know? Can anybody tell me now which which what kind of reaction is on the left and what kind of reaction is on the right? And by that I mean, is it a um a, is it a exothermic or is it a endothermic? Endothermic meaning if the system takes in energy, exothermic the system gives off energy. So which one which one is on the left and which one is on the right? Miss, um, is this first one you drew endothermic? Endothermic. What does endothermic mean? Miss, it takes in energy. Take. So, which based on this, which one do would you looks like take in the reactants are taking in the energy, and then so ultimately what what's happening is that those products are at a higher energy. Right, and so that would be the one on the right hand side. You can see that the products are at a higher energy than the reactants. So the system takes in energy. And so this would be endothermic. And then here you can kind of say it's a giving off of, well, giving out energy. So the energy for the products, so the reactants 
kind of you can think of it as the reactants kind of lose energy to a certain extent. So the products are at a lower energy than the reactants, and that's exothermic. That's one way of defining it or thinking about it. But you can share with me how you rationalize endothermic versus exothermic in your head as well. So do you want to tell me that, Anish or Beyonce, anybody? Exothermic versus endothermic. How do you rationalize it? And how, how does this, um, how do these activation energy profiles fit in with the way that you think about endothermic versus exothermic? reaction. Let's could you repeat um, the question. How do you how how do you generally rationalize endothermic versus exothermic reactions like in your own head when you think about it? How do you think about, how do you define that for yourself? And, and is that definition consistent with the graphs that I drew? You see what I'm saying? Like, does it fit in with how you would typically define endothermic versus exothermic? Do you, understand, um, do you understand what I'm asking? Yes, yes, yes I just don't know how to say it. Okay. Like, I kind of have an idea it's in my head. <laughs> well, who is that, Anish? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's hear what Beyonce says, and then I'll let Anish give her um two cents afterwards so we can oh. see if we're all aligned in our thinking here. All right, so go ahead, Beyonce, let's hear what you have. Miss, I was saying that, like, for the endothermic reaction, how I see, like, the product, they need more energy to, like, break apart so that they will take in more energy. And for the exothermic now, they need more energy to create. So they were like really hmm. miss something along that. Okay, but when you say, well, I think you said the products, but I think you meant the reactants. So so restate yeah. what you just said. So you say for the, for the endothermic, repeat again what you said. Yes, yeah, so for the endothermic, the reactants need to take in more energy to mm -hmm. form. And for the exothermic, they reduce my energy and give up my heat. Okay. I can see that. I can see how, how that aligns with the plot, with the plots here. Specifically, if you look on the right, you see you have your reactants down there. Let me get my pointer. Mm. Let me get my pointer. So if you look on the right, the plot on the right, you see that your reactants are lower. You have a high activation energy that you have to overcome. And then once you overcome that, you form your products and the products end up being at a higher um, energy than where you started for the reactants. So I can see it from that standpoint. And then for the exothermic now, you have your reactants that are fairly high energy. And then those, um, it wants it to overcome that activation energy, then it forms the products that are at, or the products are at a lower energy than the reactants were, started, were starting out. So Anish, let's see what you have to say about it. How do you rationalize this? It's basically what you said a while ago. Oh, the, how the, um, how they give off energy versus taking energy? Basically the same. Because from, from CXC, you know that endo is taking and exo is give off. So once you look at the graph, you're supposed to see if where you're ending, meaning your products are at a higher rate than your reactants, then that's endo because it's taking in. Mm -hmm. And for exo now, you look if your reactants 
are higher than the product, so that's excel because it lasts some. Okay. All right. you get it. Okay, yeah, that, that good. That explanation makes sense. All right, so we're all on the same page with where that is concerned. So let's see now. I'm going to clear this. And then... So we already spoke about that minimum energy of the colliding particles must have to in order to react. We spoke about the transition state, which is kind of just like an intermediate state that's in between your reactants and your products. Right, so we covered that. Um, so then now there are different um, things that can affect the rate of the reaction. And so the first one that we're looking at is the concentration. So how does the concentration of the solution affect the rate of reaction. So it can either make the reaction, um, depending on what's going on, there are things that can you can do to speed up the reaction, and there are things that you can do to slow it that would have a slow it, slowing down effect on it, right? And so again, we're always, this is why like, I'm very big on fundamentals because like all these things and these explanations really go back to a fundamental understanding of chemistry, right? and understanding that when you think of the particular theory of matter and you think about particles are arranged, right? From a concentration standpoint, that's just the amount of stuff that you have in a specified volume, right? And so if a solution is more concentrated, it means that you have more particles in a given volume. So like if I have a box, and the concentration, or let me not say a box, but a cup, right? And it's a high concentration. That means that there are more particles in a given volume, right? And then, so going back to the collision theory, we need these particles in our reactants to collide, right? We need them to collide. We need them to bump up against each other. They have to collide with each with, with the, um, re the requisite energy. And they also have to collide... Um, um in the correct orientation right and so if if you have a higher concentration then there's a higher probability of them colliding right so then if there's a higher probability of them colliding then by by following along with along those same lines it's going to be a higher probability of them colliding in the correct orientation right so the collision frequency increases because it's like they're more frequent collision because they're like so densely packed that they're gonna like collide with each other, right? So in that condensed space. And so if you increase your concentration, there's a high probability or high likelihood that you would increase your rate of reaction. Because remember, we're tying all of these back to rates, right? And reaction rates. So if we increase your concentration, you increase your collision frequency ultimately. And so you increase, you could increase the rate of your reaction by doing that, okay? So that's what that means. And then we have pressure. Um, and pressure is applicable for gas systems, right? You can't really speak about pressure when we're talking about solids or even liquids, right? We mostly speak about the pressure when we're speaking about gas systems. So if you have a high pressure, you have more molecules in that, in that given um, volume. Um, and so again, high pressure, high um, probability of them colliding because you have a lot of them. A lot of gas molecules are there. So there's like a lot of opportunities for them to collide with each other, a lot of opportunities for them to collide in the correct orientation. And then as a result of that, you have a, a high rate of reaction, right? So that's how the pressure comes into play here. So always you have to think back to the system at hand and, and what pressure actually means and what pressure looks like for that system and what concentration looks like for that system. And if that's a situation which would, which would enable the collision theory, you, should see the, you can see the collision theory at play where the particles are colliding with each other and they have enough energy. Then from that standpoint, then you can see how that could then translate to an increased or, or, or some kind of an effect as far as the reaction rate of the system goes, okay? So then we talk about the size of our solid particles. So here we're talking about the specific, the state of matter. Now we've been doing that all along because um, we spoke about concentration of solutions. So that's mostly a liquid kind of phase 
We're talking about, just now we spoke about the pressure of the system. That's like a gaseous system. Now we're talking about the size of solid particles, right? So you have your solid particles, and if you have a greater total area of that solid, so like your area, your surface area is, is, is greater, then there are more spaces or more points on that surface where there are points of interaction or points of contact, so to speak. And so the greater the area, the greater the number of particles are there that are exposed for interactions and for collisions with other um, particles. And so when you have a collision, then of course you can you can um, that would translate to maybe those if it's a, if it's reactant particles they react to each other they collide in the correct orientation you can get your product and so on and so forth and you can see that manifest itself in the rate of your reaction so that's one thing and so like if I have like a big chunk of chocolate so if I say I have a big chunk of chocolate here right and I break it up into smaller pieces, I expose more surface area. So the mass is the same of the chocolate, it's the same mass of chocolate, but instead of this big blob, I broke it up into smaller pieces. More, more area is then exposed, right? So there are more points of contact. So like if I have a big old solid thing and I broke it up into smaller pieces, the mass remaining constant, I didn't remove any of the mass. It's still the same overall mass, but they're smaller greater surface area, more stuff exposed, then by doing that, I can increase the rate of the reaction as well because they're more exposed pieces. So that would make, if the smaller part, if the particles are smaller, they react faster, right? So does that make sense to you guys? So those are three um, ways that we can alter rates of reaction that I just covered. Just let me know if that's making sense to you guys or if you have any questions on that so far. And these are directly related to the collision theory, right? And how we need the particles to collide and all that good stuff so that they can uh, react. Right, guys? Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Okay, cool. So again, we're like always coming back around to the collision theory. What position does this new, does this particular tweak or change put me in? If I'm changing the concentration and I'm making it higher, that means I have more um, stuff per unit volume. If I have more stuff per unit volume, there's a great opportunity for them to interact, collide, and all this good stuff, and that will increase my rate. If I'm increasing the pressure, a similar approach. There's more stuff in a specified volume, more opportunities for interaction and collisions, it increases my rate. If I have solid particles and I have this big blob, big chunk, and I make it smaller, more opportunities for collision because I'm not exposing the surface area a lot more, right? Okay, so then now we go on to, um, um, to the effect of temperature, right? And again, I, I we're hearkening back to the fundamentals, the chemistry fundamentals now as we're doing this. Temperature, guys, when you think of temperature and even when you think of it from a change of state standpoint and the effect of temperature on systems and particles in general is that if you're increasing the temperature, right, you're increasing the kinetic energy to a certain extent of the system. So you're giving those particles more energy so they'll be able to vibrate more if it's a vibratory motion, if it's that they can actually move like gases can move and the particles in liquids have more mobility, then if I'm increasing the temperature of the system, I'm increasing the kinetic energy of that system, right? And I'm giving the, the, the particles more mobility so they can move more, right? So from that, within that is this idea, as far as reaction rates go, is this idea of what they call a Boltzmann distribution curve. Have you guys ever heard of that? Boltzmann distribution curve? And do you know what that looks like? And how the temperature alters that? Do you guys know that? Have you seen that before? Miss, I've seen it. 
always. And you know what it looks like, but the temperature part, not so much. Okay, so not the temperature part, but you know the distribution curve, that, that, how that looks like. Yes, miss. Okay, so I'm going to sketch what a Boltzmann distribution curve looks like, just so we're all on the same page as far as that goes. So we have our x-axis and we have our y-axis. And our y-axis is the fraction of particles with, with energy that we're calling E, right? With energy E, you know, that's a little bit difficult to read. And then, so that's our y-axis and then our x-axis is that energy E, right? So what we're saying is the Boltzmann distribution curve um it's really showing you the fraction of particles that have a particular energy right so you have a system and they should say oh what fraction of particles in that system have the requisite energy or this energy right and so that curve looks something like this boltzmann distribution curve is just saying that there's like a distribution of energies within the system they don't all have the exact same energy there's a distribution of energy. And so to draw that, let me make sure I'm like at the right point, like here, here. So it's kind of like this. And then you come down and you have like this leveling off right here with the in line with the X axis, right? It's kind of more pointed than I want it to be, though. It should be a more broader peak. But at any rate, let me just show you how you would break it down. So you have this peak should be a little bit more broader to the point where it's like going out there where I'm drawing this dotted line. Um, but then that's your average. This is the average energy up here. We put that in a different color. The, so this dotted line represents the average energy of the system, average energy. And then down here, as it starts to like level off, where's my thing? So somewhere like here, we would that would be our activation energy. And we said the activation energy is that minimum barrier, that minimum amount of energy that you need to, um, to, to, to have that reaction proceed, right? And so where there's a shaded area here that's like this as, asymptote. You guys know asymptotes, right? So like asymptotic region here, where it's kind of like where it follows the well, you can follow the y or the x-axis, but in this case, it's following the um, x-axis. So like I'm showing a shaded region here, not very well though, but you can kind of see where I'm having these, um, this is like a shaded region. This whole asymptotic region is a shaded region. Um, this particular point here is for the activation energy, as I just said, um, and I'm showing you shaded region, and what the shaded region represents then is all of those particles that have that the, the activation energy. So it's the number of particles that have sufficient energy to react. So that's what I shaded there in that yellow or orange. Those are the particles that have the um, activation energy. And then over here is the average energy of the system, that black dotted line. And so that's generally what the Boltzmann um, distribution curve is. And so the area then under the, the total area under the curve represents the total number of particles that are in the system, right? So say you have 10,000 particles in the system, 
the area under this curve represents those 10,000 particles. And the shaded area with the orange represents those particles that have the, um, the activation energy. And then of course, on the y-axis again, you have the fraction of particles, the particular energy. So when you do the area, so it would be like fraction of particles time energy, it would give you the total number of particles in the system. So that's just like the general thinking behind the Boltzmann distribution curve here. So knowing what the area under the curve is, the area of the curve under the curve is the total number of particles in the system. You have this tail end region that represents your particles of the activation energy. And so just so that we're all oriented as far as the Boltzmann distribution curve goes, that's what it represents, right? So that's what the Boltzmann distribution curve is. Are there any questions on that? Because then now we're going to look at how the energy or the temperature shifts this curve. So are we good on that? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So now the temperature now, the temperature, if you increase the temperature, it's going to change the shape of the distribution curve. So this, as I just drew here, is your basal level, like the basic curve, right? But if you increase the energy of the system, you're going to shift it. If you increase the temperature, you're going to shift it. Because if you increase the temperature, remember the temperature factors into the energy, um, more specifically the kinetic energy of the system. So on the whole, you're going to give the particles more energy, right? So you see, oh, here we only had a certain amount, that shaded region. Only those in the tail end had enough energy, that activation energy. Well, if we increase the temperature, we're going to change that because we're giving the system or those particles, right, a greater kinetic, we're increasing the kinetic energy of those particles. So it's going to change. And so I'm going to show you how that shifts. Maybe I'll just catch on this one. I'll draw it on this one so you can see how it changes. And so remember that the area under the curve represents the total number of particles, right? So I'm going to show you how that, how the energy, the, the, how the change in temperature manifests itself as an energy change in the system and, and the number of particles then having a specific amount of energy. If I can just get my pencil to function the way it ought to function. Let's see. All right, so let me show, oh, I did choose another color. So this is here, let's call this first curve that I drew temperature one, right? So that's before we increase the temperature. So that's our initial temperature of the system. We have our average energy here and we have our activation energy um, or the, the shaded region with the particles that have that, the number of particles that have that activation energy. So now I'm going to increase the energy of the system and you're going to see how the curve shifts. So we're going to now have, let me draw from here. You see that now I'm shifting, it's shifting to the right and it's also the curve is becoming broader, the peak is becoming broader. And again, it's gonna level out asymptotically again, like that, right? But now you see that when I break it off, when it starts to level off, like here, it will be around here, well, maybe down here, it starts to level off. And so this shaded region now that I'm putting it in pink, you see that that shaded region is greater than the shaded region before. The shaded region before in the orange is a smaller area at that T1 than it is now at T2, right? So you see that T2 is this pink line, is this pink curve, T2, this shaded area, which represents the activation energy, that's that that's asymptote, that, that that end part, that has a greater area than it did when I was at T1, which is a lower energy. 
right? And so you see that we have more particles now having the activation energy. So more particles can now overcome that barrier to having the reaction proceed. So that's one thing that shifts in the temperature does. Um, and it shift the temperature as well. There are more particles with an energy greater than the activation energy, which is what I just said. So that's really the net effect of it, um, of shifting the, um, shifting the curve is that you have more particles that have more than the activation energy that you need to overcome. Wait, I'm hearing a feedback. I'm hearing myself in a feedback. Give me a minute here. Let me see where that is. Okay. So now you have more, you have, you have more particles having that general activation energy. They can overcome that activation energy. And so you can have more collisions. And if you have more collisions, the probability of the particles hitting each other in the correct orientation and with enough energy to break up those former bonds and form new bonds, that probability significantly increases. And that's just as a result, a direct result of you increasing the temperature of the system, right? So that's particularly interesting. And if we can, re we can relate that back to the basics of chemistry, the fundamentals of chemistry in just how much increase in the temperature of something can have a significant effect on how those particles move about, right? And how they collide. Um, but what we just did here is show what that looks like from a distribution standpoint and how that energy is distributed um, over the total number of particles that are in that system. Does that make sense? Does this make sense? I know it can be a little bit of a lot to grasp, but let me know if you're understanding this or, or how this is working out for you guys. Does this make sense? The effect of temperature on the system, the effect of temperature on the Boltzmann distribution curve, how it shifts it, how it changes the shape and what that shape change of shape means. Does this all make sense to you guys? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what Anish mentioned earlier. We're gonna talk about enzymes and um, catalysis and how catalysis plays a role in um, the rates of the reaction, right? So let's move on to that. Okay, so I have my mouse. Let me clear this, clear this, clear this, clear this. Okay, ooh, catalysis, catalysis. Okay, so you guys talk to me about catalysis. What is catalysis? What's a catalyst? Um, how does it factor into Well, we spoke about largely in the collision theory. We're tying everything back to the collision theory. So we need our particles to collide with enough energy so that they can break the bonds that formally held them together, those reactants. The bond energy need the bond energy need the bond needs to be broken, right? And you need to be able to overcome that activation energy as well. So when we talk about catalysts, first of all, tell me what's a catalyst period. How does it work? What is it? And how does that factor in? To, uh, to activation energy and the collision theory as a whole. Anybody want to tell me how catalysts play a role in, in rates of reactions? Like what, what are they really, catalysts? Anybody, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm listening, okay? List the catalyst is something that speeds up the rate of reaction. Okay, how does it do it? How does it do that? <laughs> Miss, I don't know exactly how it does it, but I think it lowers like, the activation energy. Yeah, that's exactly right. It lowers the activation energy of the system. And so really the way, the way in which it does it, right? I'm going to sketch here, but really the way that the catalyst does it, see the catalyst provides an alternate reaction pathway. So just earlier we were showing reaction pathways when we were talking about endothermic, exothermic, 
what the catalyst does is it comes in and it gives the reaction a different pathway for it to proceed through, right? A pathway in which the activation energy or that barrier to entry is lowered, right? So that's what the catalyst does. It lowers the barrier to entry by giving the system or the reactants a different pathway to travel that has a smaller amount of energy for it to overcome so that the reaction can proceed. So I'll just draw that one here. So this is our reaction pathway on the x-axis like we did before. So we have our reaction pathway. And uh, on our x, on our y-axis, we have energy um and so in the first instant so i'm going to show you when it's catalyzed versus when it's uncatalyzed what happens and so we have where is my point? Where's my pencil? Okay. So we have the energy here. We have our activation energy, which is this generally this hump thing, right? So we have our hump that it has to come overcome. Um, and so in the instant where we don't have a catalyst, maybe I should extend this uh, y axis a little bit longer. So then we have our transition state. Remember the transition state is where it levels off at this line up here, right? So to get to the transition state, we have to overcome the activation energy, which for the uncatalyzed reaction is this line that I just drew here. So that's your EA right there that you have to overcome. That's the uncatalyzed reaction. So the activation energy is what it is. There are no catalysts in the system. That's your activation energy, right? But when you have a catalyst in the system, it provides, as we said, a different reaction pathway. And so this hump, this big hump that you had there is actually not going to be that big anymore. It's going to be really small, a very tiny hump compared to that. You're getting to the same place, right? But it's a different pathway for the reactants to travel, uh, a pathway in which there's, le there's less resistance, if that makes sense. It's a lower barrier to entry. So this is now your activation um, energy of that catalyzed reaction. So this new arrow that I just draw will now be your E, A, and that is for the catalyzed reaction, right? So when you compare the two, you see that, oh, there's like a higher activation energy here when it's uncatalyzed. When it's catalyzed, the activation energy decreases significantly. You're getting to the same place, right? You're getting to the same pathway, the same endpoint, but the path that you take to get there has a least as a lower barrier to entry, right? So that's what catalysts do. That's how they function. They give the system or the reaction a different and alternate pathway that's easier for it to, um, for the reaction to proceed, right? Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, and then um, from, a, from a Boltzmann distribution curve standpoint, we can also draw another um, plot, uh, a plot that's, that shows catalyzed reaction versus uncatalyzed reaction from a Boltzmann distribution standpoint. And you might remember just now we said the Boltzmann distribution curve just shows us the fraction of particles that have specific amounts of energy. And so from a Boltzmann distribution standpoint, what's gonna happen is you have the fraction of particles that then have the, en the requisite energy, the activation energy is gonna be greater. So like, if I'm gonna draw that distribution curve again here, Remember again that for the Boltzmann distribution curve or Y axis is a fraction of particles with a given energy, right? So fraction of 
particles with energy E, right? That's what we had said earlier. And then our, what did we say our x-axis was again for the Boltzmann distribution curve? What's the x-axis? What does the x-axis represent? The x-axis represents our energy E. So that's our total, just energy, the total energy of the system, whereas the y-axis is a fraction of particles that have energy E, right? Okay, so, so the Boltzmann distribution curve, as you remember, is the distribution of the particles in the system and what the energy that they have looks like, right? So the curve is like this. Oh. Put this pointy part here, and then it kind of like, as I said, asymptotically like levels off with the x-axis, right? And so in the general state where there's no catalyst, you remember that we had a region out here where it started leveling off asymptotically that we said that if we shaded that region, all of those particles would have the activation energy. That's what that means. The asymptotic, this portion, when we shade it, that's the total number of particles that have the activation energy. Um, and that's for an uncatalyzed system, right? But when we have a catalyst, as we just showed on the left for that pink plot, when we have a catalyst in the system, the activation energy is significantly lowered, right? And so if the, if the activation energy is significantly lowered, then that means that more particles in the system will have that bare minimum energy that's needed for the reaction to proceed. And so that's how it speeds up. The catalyst would speed up the reaction because no more particles have the required energy. So more of them can participate in that collision and then you know increase, ultimately increase the rate of reaction. So we show that on the Boltzmann distribution curve by having a greater shaded area. So we start, so where is my... Okay, so we so say here, right? We have this region now that represents the E A catalyzed, catalyzed, and so this entire now newly shaded region. Let me choose a pick a different color. I'm gonna pick green. Pick green. So then this new shaded region, this area now, this entire area, you can see that that's bigger than what we had before, right? So there are more particles now with that minimum, with that activation energy because of the addition of the catalyst. And so that whole green area now represents all the particles that now have the activation energy and so the reaction can proceed and you can have more collisions and ultimately a faster rate of reaction. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes, miss. Okay. Yeah. So there, do you have any questions though or is it all super clear? Clear. Okay. All right. So then now um, we have special types of catalysts that are known as enzymes. Enzymes are the ones that we talk about the most. Um, and they, from a biological standpoint, they have a lot of significance, right? Because even as we digest our food, we have digestive enzymes. We have a bunch of different enzymes that are present naturally in our bodies. Right, so it makes sense for us to focus our, our, our little bit of our time and our energy and enzymes and how exactly it is that they work. And so let me clear this. I don't know why this is always acting up. Let's see.
Okay, so enzymes. All right, so enzymes are protein catalysts. They're catalysts that are protein based, right? So they're proteins in nature, these enzymes. And really, as we mentioned earlier, catalyst function is that they speed up a reaction by providing an alternate reaction pathway for the reaction to proceed. Um, they themselves, the enzymes, they aren't altered in the process. They are what they are, but they just, um, they're in the system and they can interact or act on their substrates, which is what Anish was saying before in a lock and key way. So it fits into particular grooves on the reactants. And as a result of that, you know, there's a lowering of activation energy. And as a result of that, the rate of the reaction increases, right? So um, when we talk about enzymes, as I mentioned earlier, they catalyze most of the reactions that we have in our bodies as human beings. They're protein based. And so they're like biomolecules. Um, they have an active site on their surface and it's the active site. Um, so maybe I should just like, well, let me maybe type this in a box. I'm not gonna use the, I'm not gonna draw it because I don't know why it doesn't quite work well like that, but I'll just kind of like write down the main features or how we think of these, um, enzymes is that they have active sites right on their surface and the active sites is is where bond that bonds with the substrate right or your reactant and through that they then um catalyze the reaction right so let me So we have active sites on surface of catalysts slash enzymes, right? Because our enzymes in our, our catalysts in this case are enzymes, um, which are protein-based enzymes. As we said earlier, they have active sites on the surface. Um, binds, these binds with the substrate. And the substrate might be your reactant or is all very often your reactant. So you have a system, you have your reactants here, you add in an enzyme into the system. The enzyme has active sites on it that binds with the substrate, like it's like a lock and key, it fits it, right? It binds with it like this. And then when it binds with the substrate, then it catalyzes a reaction, right? That's typically how we have our enzymes working. And remember, enzymes are just a class of catalysts, right? One class, very, one of the most important classes, I would say, especially from a biological standpoint, right? Um, so a substrate is a reactant that is bound, it's loosely bound to the enzyme. And the enzymes are specific in the reactions that they catalyze. So like you have proteases, let me think of it. They have, they have different names that are that in, in, inherent in the name is the functions that they carry out. But there's not one enzyme that does, and no enzyme does everything, catalyzes every reaction. The enzymes are specific for the reactions that they catalyze. So proteases, you have... How can I, what can I, why can't I remember all the other ones from the top of my head? Um, you have a bunch of different um, enzymes and they, they're all specific to function, right? They're all, they, they all carry out specific function. They don't, there's no one enzyme that catalyzes every single reaction. They're very specific in what they do, right? Um, and, and largely that's because um, it's like this lock and key thing. It only fits into a particular groove that it recognizes and it fits in and that's its groove. And, that, that, and, and when it binds there, it speeds up that reaction. If it doesn't fit, it's not gonna work, right? It has to be the correct fit. So the, only, the enzymes only catalyze specific reactions. Um, and so because it fit, what they call 
they call that site that it fits into, they call it an active site. And so when it fits into that active site, then it allows the bonds that are to be broken. The, the, because remember that the reaction, the process of the reaction, the reaction pathway involves a breaking of old bonds in the reactants to then form in new bonds to get you your products, right? So the lock and key thing where we have the active site, you know, binding in, binding with the substrate um, into that active site, right? The active site with the binding on the substrate, they're coming together. That's what causes those bonds to be broken from the substrate to then rearrange to form new bonds in your product ultimately. Okay. So that's that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all I have for today from a rate of reaction standpoint. Um, so that's just like the fundamental thing or the basis of it and the and how we tie in the particular theory of matter to all of this. So this is really like just like laying the groundwork for rates of reaction. And then we can start to, to then talk about or think about um, the rate equation and the order of reactions and stuff like that and all that good stuff. But what I've done today is just kind of lay the framework for this discussion, and then we can continue on with this um, analysis next time, which is going to be the 27th, so two weeks from now. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how much of this module, module two, we're going to be able to cover because it's very, it's a lot, you know? And so I, let me go back, let me clear this. Let me clear it. And so if there's like a specific, I'm gonna go, I want to go back to my screen where I have all of the things, where I have all the subtopics underneath module two. So then maybe if there's one in particular that's giving you a lot of problems that you don't want me to maybe jump to in the interest of time, maybe we could do that next time. So that's on the 27th when we meet. Um, but if I go in this order that I have planned, which I would like to, but time doesn't permit that. Um, if I go in that order, probably we won't get to like the end parts of it, the end parts of module, the end parts of module two. So let me clear this. And then module three, like what I found is that I think throughout all of them, even like, well, let me not say up, let me not say unit two, but for CXC and unit one the um the first two modules are the modules that you absolutely it helps to be taught that like to have somebody break those things down for you and walk you through those those concepts and what i find is that module three is generally more like you can kind of just study that stuff on your own and swap that stuff if that makes sense and just kind of memorize and kind of pick up on like little um patterns but like module two, like this stuff, it, it helps to have somebody to talk you through and walk you through this stuff. And module one, two, with the fundamentals of chemistry and electronic configuration and all this other stuff that you did before this, right? Um, enthalpy and, and Boyle's law and kinetic theory and energetics and all that stuff. That stuff, you, you definitely have to be taught or talk, walked through. Um, but the you module three stuff, the point I'm trying to make is that the module three stuff, you can study that on your own. You don't necessarily need a teacher to like talk you through it, right? But this stuff that I'm doing today, I, I think it helps to have somebody like actually teach you this stuff and do practice problems on it with. Um, so my question is, what do you guys want to do? You, what do you want to do? Is there a specific one underneath this? that you want me to jump to that's like particularly difficult because we won't have time to do all of them as much as I would like to do all of the topics on the unit, on the module two, we don't, we don't have time to do all of them. So I'm trying to get back to my home screen where I have the topic so we can look at them and then you tell me which one I should jump to next time, which is on the 27th when we meet again. So let's see, I'm gonna go back to it now. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yep, 
Yeah, so this is it. Okay, here it is. Yeah, this is it. But it's a reaction. We just we just touched the surface today. There's chemical equilibrium, acid base equilibrium, buffers and pH, solubility product, redox equilibria. Also, all of these, which one would you guys want to spend the next the next session on, which is on the 27th? Like, what is the hardest thing for you to grasp? Like, I know Beyonce said that they're like somewhere between two and three in her class. So I guess she ha you haven't really had an opportunity to, to decide which one out of all of these would be the hardest for you. Um, but Anish, where, what, what do you want to add something here? Do you want to chime in here? Miss, I'm going through my notebook for one second. Okay. Miss question, what um module is energetics under? I think that's module one. Oh, I didn't know that you guys are to the same school. Oh, I didn't know, okay. I uh, think we're at the same spot we looked at so the different of last class. Okay, all right. So Beyonce has said that she has to leave because she has another meeting, but she learned a lot today. Um, I didn't know you guys are at the same school. That's cool. All right. So what 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 did you say? No, you're asking me where. Um, what did you just ask me again? I was asking about energetics because we haven't started um acid base equilibria or buffers and pH as yet. So the only things on the list to choose from are one, two, five, and six. Okay. Five and two are not a problem for me. You just okay. run through one. We clear up a lot of stuff. So thank you for that. Okay, that's good. I'm happy to hear that. My um, problem is with energetics. Okay. Specifically the enthalpy cycle method. I... I'm not understanding that at all. Okay. Clearly. Okay. So let's see. Um, do you mean like Hess's law or Hess's law or lattice energy? Like which which part of it? Like all of it? Not all. Not all of it, Miss. There's just a, few, a section of it that deals with combustion. 
Okay, so this section that needs a combustion. Combustion or formation. So they like give you a formula and you have to do a whole different things. Oh, like, yeah. That I know happens. what you mean. Yeah, it's heck is a lot, I think. Not getting that 100%. Okay. All right, so I can maybe spend some time on this next time. I know, I think I know where you're talking about. Yeah, I'll spend a bit of time on this. Is yes, yeah. so this is what I mean when I say that there are like topics that like if you have to really sit down and like match it out properly, because otherwise it's like it, it's not something. It's not something that you can study the night before the exam. Is what I'm saying, right? Like there are things that you can study the night before the exam and it's good. It's like okay, it's super straightforward. Like it's what what it says in the book is what it is. There are things that are like that and mostly module three stuff. And I guess that's for a reason, right? Why it's at the end. So if you run out of time, you can study it on your own. But like this stuff that you're asking about is like, yeah, it definitely needs some practice and like proper explaining. So I, I can put this in for next time. So that's on the 27. So yeah, I mean, we can do that next time. And then I... I'll see where we are. If there's any interest in like a past paper marathon session, I could have that in April. Um, and then we can do more um, like past paper type questions. Um, exactly those, spend time on those. And that would be like a small fee for that. And I'll let you guys know when that is and what that would be like. Um, and then if you have any classmates who might want to join in for those past paper sessions, definitely let me know too. Um, so how many students are in your class right now for unit one? Just four. Very Wait, small. Really? At your school? Just it's only four. four? Just four of us. Willing wow. and able. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll keep you posted on that um past paper marathon session and definitely bring them, bring the other two people um for that. And then um, for next time, I plan on do, plan on doing something for energetics for Hesse's law, and then uh, we'll see what else can be fitted in that session on the twenty seventh. Okay. Yes, Miss. Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. Have a great week. Thank you. All right, bye.